Art exists in a wide variety of mediums and styles, much like the clothes we wear in our day-to-day -day lives. But in the world of couture, how well do these artistic themes translate to garments? I have created this lecture to discuss the specific artistic style of surrealism and to examine how well it translates into couture. So let's take a look. Hello and welcome my lovely audience, my lovely, lovely, lovely acolytes to the surrealism in fashion, the art of the avant avant-garde lecture. Thank you so much for attending. Today we're going to be discussing the surrealist art movement and fashion and how those two link together. But before we get started with that, before we get into the clothes, we must ask ourselves, what is surrealism and where did it come from? So now we have to turn the clock back just a little bit before we actually start talking about the surrealist movement because... There was an art movement before Surrealism, and that was called Dada or Dadaism. Now, Dada is French for the word hobby horse. Allegedly, the way this came about was that the artists behind the movement were all gathered in a location called the Cabaret Voltaire, which is where they would meet, play their artist games, perform, etc., etc., etc. And they kind of threw a metaphorical dart at a dictionary, and it landed on Dada. Dada was an anti-art movement, and it was brought about by essentially the oncomings of World War I, um, and it protested the values that were believed to have brought about the First World War, um, academia, hyper-intellectualism, rationalism, such things. Surrealism came after World War I. It was sort of an offshoot of Dadaism. When I tell you that there is a lot of interpersonal drama behind this, Oh my goodness. The Surrealists and the Dadaists are probably some of the best soapbox, soap opera drama you could ever possibly get. The letters to each other, absolutely insane. Surrealism is post-World War I. It's post-1920s. The term was officially coined by the poet Guillaume Apollinaire in 1917. But the movement itself was not properly established until 1924 with the publishing of André Breton's uh, surrealist manifesto, Poisson Soluble, uh, which literally translates to soluble fish, as in a fish that dissolves in water, um, which is a demonstration of surrealist ideas. So surrealism focused heavily mostly on painting and poetry. A lot of surrealist artists got their start as poets, but there were other aspects uh, such as sculpture, costuming, all sorts of things, even film. And the goal of surrealism was sort of two-part. Um, it wanted to allow for the expression of things in the unconscious mind, the subconscious. So think of things like dreams, you know, uh, unconscious thought and such. Um, as well as bridging fantasy and reality together uh, in order to create a personal, political, and psychological sense of freedom. It was about putting, it was, the TLDR, the easiest way to explain this, is that it was about making the weird shit happen. It was about exploring the self. It was about juxtaposition, so placing two unlike things kind of next to each other just to see what would happen and that's how you got a lot of um a lot of those paintings with very strange landscapes that had all sorts of randomized objects in there so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some examples of surrealists and some examples of surrealist art to kind of give you a, a a footing like a sense of placement where we are here this is dorothea tanning she was born in 1910 in galesburg illinois and she passed in 2012 she was a hundred and one years old that's crazy um she attended knox college before studying painting in chicago she met fellow surrealist max ernst in 1914 in new york and they were partners for 34 years they it, the jury's kind of out on whether or not they were officially married. Um, Ernst had quite a few partners. And a lot of surrealists actually fled America post-World War... Or fled to America, excuse me, post-World War I, and especially during World War II, during the Nazi occupation of Germany and other countries. Her early work is what carries the most surrealistic influence. As once Ernst passed, she wanted to move further away from the medium and sort of establish herself as her own individual as an artist, which I completely understand. One of the quotes that she has given, had given, 
once her partner had passed was that the paint had no color, she could no longer hear sound, and as, it was as though the life had been drained out of her studio. Okay, so this is the painting that she was actually working on when she met Max Ernst. This is called Birthday. Max Ernst actually named the painting for her. It was, there was a documented conversation in which he came into her home one night for a party, and she showed this to him, and he asked her, does it have a name? She says, no, I haven't really thought about naming it, and he goes, you can call it Birthday. Okay, so you look here, you see all these multiple doors. We're very familiar with the surrealist concept of illusion and breaking planes of perspective. Um, surrealism is also very figurative. It plays a lot with anatomy, specifically the female form and eroticism. The colors are absolutely gorgeous. And the unconventional use of certain materials and textures in her clothing. Make note of that. Make note of this seaweed, algae, lichen-like material that she is wearing as clothes. Because that will come into play later. So this is a piece of Dorothea Tanning's work. Now we will talk about her partner, Max Ernst. Max Ernst was a part of both the Dadaist and the Surrealist movement. He helped pioneer them throughout Europe. He was a painter, a poet, a sculptor, a printmaker, and graphic artist. He was born in 1891 in Germany, and he actually passed on April 1st in the late 70s. Now, the thing about Ernst is, because he will actually lead us into our segue, he painted this, The Temptation of St. Anthony. Now, this painting was for a film contest. Now, if you know the title of the painting, The Temptation of St. Anthony, for any of my art history nerds, this might not be the one you're familiar with, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, but again, you see that sort of distorted landscape, a lot of you know, fantasy figures, a lot of fantasy creatures, um, warped perspective, things kind of melting into each other. A lot of surrealism was focused on the psyche and playing with the eye. And we'll get into that when we talk more about the clothes. They even had um, a series of games that um, dealt with dealing with the mind. Um, and in regards to blending things together, one of the games that they would play translates literally to the exquisite corpse. Now, the way you would play the exquisite corpse is you would fold a piece of paper into three sections and fold part of it away. One person would draw, fold that drawing down. Another person would draw, fold that drawing down. And then a third person would draw on that section and you would have a created body of sorts. And it was really interesting to see how all those sorts of things would blend together. Now, this was created for a film contest he actually won the film contest. However, his other contemporary also entered the, that same film contest, and that is Salvador Dali. Now, the temptation of St. Anthony that most people are actually familiar with is Dali's. In fact, I bet you if I show it to you, you will uh, recognize it almost immediately. This is Dali's temptation of St. Anthony, oil on canvas. It was done in 1946. This one is on book covers, it's on posters, it's on postcards, it's everywhere. It's, you cannot get away from it. I actually own a book with this painting on the cover. Yes, so this is Dali's version of St. Anthony, and it is arguably more popular and more famous than Max Ernst. Um, do with that what you will. Yeah, there's even memes. So this is Salvador Dali. He was born in 1904 in Spain, and he passed in 1989. Now, the thing about Dali, um, and I'm going to hurt some of y'all's feelings, I'm sorry, he was considered a latecomer to the Surrealist movement. He did not show up until about 1929, um, and a lot of his work spans not just Surrealism, but Cubism, uh, modern art, etc., etc. He also wasn't super popular amongst his, his fellow artists and contemporaries, even though they loved his work because he is a very skilled man because of his antics and because of how commercial he was. See, the point of Dada and Surrealism is they were also forms of protest art. 
because of the ongoing war and as a means of escapism a lot of the artists you will notice in these movements were men because a lot of them were either soldiers quite a few of them were medics Breton as mentioned earlier the gentleman who wrote the surrealist manifesto I believe was a medic but many of them were soldiers many of them had seen war so these were seen as a means of expressing the things that were locked inside of themselves Dali however had a lot of eccentricism about him he was very commercial he worked with you know fashion designers and filmmakers and all sorts of people uh walked an aardvark around on a leash at one point i believe and for those of you who do not know this this is persistence of memory this is the uh little famous clock painting this was one of his first surrealist works and it was done in 1931 it's an oil on canvas piece and dali's portfolio includes sculpting painting art uh, graphic arts, design, photography, and the design is what we're going to be focusing on today. The Persistence of Memory is probably one of the most recognizes, recognized pieces of artwork just throughout art history in general. That being said, we want to focus on the design aspect of his career because he did do designing, specifically fashion designing. Who did he design with? I will reveal that to you in due time. But how does this connect to fashion? So surrealism is expressed in textile work in a variety of ways. It doesn't just include the clothes, but as well as the theming and the accessories. So what common themes are we working with? Well, like earlier, the body anatomy, there's also wildlife, there's sexuality, illusions, and merging opposites. Um, specifically within the gender binary, Terry Mugler, who we'll be talking about later in the lecture, um, actually did this quite frequently by taking male or male presenting individuals and putting them in feminine silhouettes. Um, unique materials as well. Plastic was a big thing in surrealism, especially in the 30s, because it wasn't so widely known or widely used. Latex, human hair, <laughs> all sorts of odd and unconventional materials were used um, in order to create surrealist clothing. Which leads us to the Dali and Scaparelli collaboration. This is a makeup compact made to look like a rotary phone. The key thing that I want to talk about, and this is something that might be more recognized recognizable amongst others is the Dali Scaparelli compilation uh, collaboration excuse me now one of the big things in surrealism take thing make it look like other thing or take thing that is useful render it useless it's about celebrating absurdity or just being kind of ridiculous for the sake of human expression Yes. So this is a makeup compact that is designed to look like the rotary part of a rotary phone so let's get a brief background on Schiaparelli. For those who have been here before, I have discussed this designer way, way early on. She is my personal favorite. She, uh, I think, is just an absolute, absolute treat. She was born in 1890 in Italy. She established her fashion house in 1927. There were some ups and downs um, throughout her career, but her fashion house is still producing clothes today, and I think that's really neat. Uh, she began her start... Funnily enough, uh, selling knitwear, uh, specifically her trompe l'oeil sweater. Now, what does that mean? I probably pronounced that terribly, but this term here means trick the eye. So let's look at her sweater. So a big thing, illusions, right? The illusion that this sweater has a bow on it. It does not actually have a bow on it, but it is knitted and color blocked in such a way that you would think that it would at a distance. Um, and this was kind, it kind of became her icon. Uh, she was also noted as one of the first designers to uh, develop the wrap dress. She took inspiration from women's aprons and helped develop her own version of a wrap dress. Yes, it originated as surrealist style because in surrealism, one of the key themes is literally, it, literally tricking the eye, making you think something else is there when it may not be. It's about playing with the mind and playing with the psyche. It's, it's, it's literally about mind fuckery as a means of personal expression. But, and she was also one of the first designers to offer clothes with visible zippers. She developed her own color, her own shade of pink called Shocking Pink. So the first thing we'll talk about in the Dali Schiaparelli uh, co collaboration, that is a mouthful. Dali and Scaparelli worked together to create a few items of clothing, uh, both taking inspiration from each other. And the first thing we're going to take a look at is the shoe hat. Shoe hat! <laughs> 
So this hat is made of black felt. There are two versions, one of which we'll take a peek at in just a moment on video. Story time, this shoe hat was inspired by uh, Dali's wife, uh, had Gala, uh, take, uh, took a picture of Dali uh, with a woman's shoe on his head and one on his shoulder. Uh, and Scaparelli said, hey, I'm never going to let you live that down, fam. <laughs> and so now what I'd like to do is I'm going to pause our Spotify. I want us to take a look at the shoe hat in video form because this shoe hat in the video that I have chosen, you can see that pink color, that shocking pink uh, on the heel. So let's see about the shoe hat, shall we? So Scaparelli's uh, shoe hat derives mm -hmm. in part from a reference to a photograph that Salvador Dali's wife took of him wearing a woman's shoe perched on his head. Mm -hmm. And much like that photograph, this hat kind of mimics that notion of an upside down shoe worn on one's head. Mm -hmm. Scaparelli created two versions of this hat. One uh, was all black mm -hmm. and the other, this and this one, is the other is one, a black um, base of the shoe, but with the heel created out of fuchsia pink silk velvet. Mm -hmm. There's quite a contrast uh, between Scaparelli's day wear and evening wear. Much of her day. Okay. So that was her hat. That was the shoe hat. And the woman was correct. There was a significant contrast between Scaparelli's day wear and evening wear. Um, there was a lot of color play in her day wear. Um, as opposed to her evening wear, it would usually follow a classic silhouette with a bit of a twist. And we'll see that here uh, in just a second. Our next piece is the Terge dress. I've spoken about this dress before. So it makes, again, it makes use of that theme of illusion. The print of the fabric appearing to be torn, revealing that pink underneath. We get the sensation of either filleted skin or kind of peeling wallpaper. What's special about this is it's printed directly like onto the fabric, which was not a common technique at the time. Um, we will be taking a look at this one on video as well. So Scaparelli's Terra's dress was created in conjunction with the surrealist artist Salvador Dali. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's a reference to some of Dali's own work. Yes. Paintings which he depicted women. Yes, uh, there we go. Three young women flesh. The dress holding the skin of their arms. Yes. clever printed technique on the surface of the textile. It mimics the image of flesh torn mm -hmm. from the body. And the mantle, which is meant to be worn over the head with the textile falling around the shoulders through slits in the surface of the fabric that are then um, covered over with a now bright... Now look at, look, look at just that, the way that that's layered there and that precision in the line and just the way that it's, that it's, that it's cut. Yeah, the illusion of it all through print is very good. It's a very clever way of doing it too. And again, playing into that theme of tricking the eye and tricking the mind contrasting color. This also uh, mimics the image or the notion mm -hmm. of uh, flesh that is flayed or torn. With Scaparelli's... Okay, so that is the tears dress. Beep. Or tears dress, excuse me. <laughs> and then we have my personal favorite, the skeleton dress. Um, this pulls directly from Dali's drawings of anatomy of the female figure, specifically the female skeleton. The dress is made of a silk crepe material. It is designed to sort of hug the body and function as a secondary skin. And the bones were made using a quilting technique where you work the fabric over wadded up cotton and stitch it down in order to create a sort of molded 3D shape. Yes? Wife. Do you think that Christian Louboutin took inspiration from the shoe hat to create mm. the red inner heel shoes? I'm sorry, this is a late question. Oh, excuse me. I don't think so, because there's a very separate origin story for Louis Vuitton Red. Um, the skeleton dress also played into and played off of the goings-on at the time, 1938, the year this dress was put together, uh, was a very tumultuous year. Uh, because World War II. And people were looking for escapism and looking for ways, quite literally, to express how they were feeling in a manner that was deemed just socially acceptable. And a fun fact about this dress, and I believe they touch upon it in the video, 
uh, that I am going to show you is that at the shoulders here and here, you'll notice that the neckline is quite high, and that is because the way you would get in and out of this dress is at the shoulders, there are zippers. So you would unzip the shoulders and slip yourself into the dress that way. And that is how you would wear that. So let's take a look at the video I pulled of Scaparelli's skeleton dress. This look dress at that. Is made from a very supple black silk crepe. Black silk crepe. Um, luxurious, lightweight, very sheer material. Mm -hmm. And Scaparelli has achieved an effect of tracing Hi, the, of the body through a really elaborate quilting technique. Mm -hmm. It's certainly clear that she's referencing some of the works on paper and paintings that Salvador Dali himself mm -hmm. made that feature very prominent skeletons in the landscape. Yes. On the surface of the dress, Scaparelli mm -hmm. has stitched the outlines of each of the bones, and then through the lining of the dress, Scaparelli has then fed through a kind of padding mm -hmm. or wadding that then has the effect of kind of raising the dress fabric there you go. away from the skin. As a result, she's created a kind of a skeleton on the surface yes. of the dress that's a really direct contrast to the elegant, sinuous line yes. of the garment. So what she did here is she took a very traditional, for the time, like silhouette of the dress and essentially just flavored it, Scaparelli flavoring, with the sort of bones here. And the dress was specifically designed to be comfortable to wear. That is why it is made out of such a soft and luxurious material. So it is a delightful blending of a little bit of macabre, a little bit of the surreal, um, and practical fashion, which we can always appreciate. We're about to move on to one of the more whimsical pieces in the Pears collab, and that would be the lobster dress, baby! This is the lobster dress. It pulls from Dolly's work. Fun fact about this, um... The pair actually got into a little bit of a tiff because Dali wanted to add mayonnaise, a mayonnaise motif to the gown to really bring home that uh, that 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 surrealist sort of haha -ha absurdity. Um, the dress is printed onto silk organza, the lobster, the lobster print, and features little bits of parsley. And if we go over here, we can get a better look at the dress. Yes, lobster dress. So if we scroll down here, you can see that lovely kind of coral inset, and then you can get a better view of the actual printed lobster. It was specifically inspired by his lobster phone uh, and a few other uh, <laughs> lobster motifs he had throughout its work. Um, not Manny, it wouldn't be literal, or, well, maybe it would have been, we don't know. <laughs> Dali was disappointed that Scaparelli did not allow him to mail the lobster dress. So deeply unfortunate. <laughs> but you can see it, it also is reminiscent kind of of a dinner napkin if you really think about it like it looks like dinner on the body in both like a literal and metaphorical sense um and that is one way to bring home your food with you i think <laughs> so to conclude this is a very tiny dose of what that sort of fashion was like at the time given that this took place in between and in the middle of two world wars everything was sort of in flux and up and down um surrealist fashion included things uh, as simple as bright colors or stripes or polka dots because at the time fashion was seen as something to be a bit more rigid and a bit more conventional just given the political climate for example, shocking pink, the color that I showed you on the heel of the shoe hat, was considered radical because of how bright it was. And Schiaparelli put this color on everything, literally everything, including the tips of her cigarettes. Her cigarette filters were Schiaparelli shocking pink. <laughs> how something even as simple as a bright color can be considered radical depending on the time period that you're in. And it was, it was, because think about it you guys this was war this was war that was taking place so if you were you know trouncing about 
in these bright, beautiful colors, it was it was seen as an oddity because, well, what do you have to be happy about, you know? But it was seen as a form of protest. It is, I do not agree with this thing. I do not agree with these feelings. But yes, that's why it was radical, because at the time, you were sort of expected to have either staunch patriotism or be somber. Um... And that is what surrealism was kind of turning on its head. Same with Dadaism that came before it. Uh, Schiaparelli in the modern day, they're still producing clothes. Schiaparelli was being directed by Daniel Ross Ferry. I'm not sure if that's true anymore. I have to double check. Has There's a lot more like modern flavor to it. We'll take a look at these pieces in just a moment. She's, they, the house still works with bright pops of color. However, there's a lot bigger focus on exaggerating the silhouette and using interesting materials, as well as referencing past things like the lobster dress. Schiaparelli is also credited as being one of the first designers to sort of balloon out the shoulder and over-exaggerate the shoulder on the garments. So let's take a look at some modern Schiaparelli. This is uh, Schiaparelli's motherboard. I think that's very, very fitting. Let's scroll down here. You can see all the individual circuit boards, the rhinestones, the the bedazzling. Up here on the shoulder, you have a whole old school Samsung phone, uh, <laughs> which I think is great. That concept of repurposing something so unconventional and using it to make a piece of apparel is absolutely marvelous and falls very much in line with surrealist values. You've got uh, the keyhole here. That's a calculator. I had that calculator. Like the scraps of leather with the nails and the screws in. Um, you have Valk mentioned, I saw you talk about that sort of very futuristic kind of plastic neck piece. But again, you have plastic, you have metal, you have, you have pieces of things that don't necessarily fit into the conventional idea of what clothes are. And that's what surrealist fashion, especially modern day surrealist fashion likes to do is take this notion of something being like, oh, that can't be clothes, and going, oh, it absolutely can. So this is an example of the exaggerated silhouette here. And again, using that, um, these are like crocheted lace doilies coming way up onto that frame and then back down again, that very exaggerated shoulder line. Um, absolutely stunning. I like how it creates sort of a shield over the model's face almost. You know, like a mask that you're not really wearing. Um, <laughs> I like... Uh, uh, and then, of course, you have, like, the exaggerated jewelry. And then the back, too. You get a very kind of butterfly moment. It also sort of feels like a human pelvis. Um, especially looking at it from this angle. You really get that sort of anatomy, um, skeletal sort of effect. Um, and then, of course, you have the lobster references. <laughs> Long live the Scaparelli lobster. Um, oversized jewelry is also considered very, very surrealist. Anything that's big, anything that seems sort of unnatural or um, what would be considered untoward in certain situations is a very surrealist thing. So, what about other designers? Um, Scaparelli is definitely the most prominent uh, surrealist fashion designer that we have out there. A lot of people are quite, quite familiar. However, there are so many <laughs> different designers that uh, use surrealist concepts uh, in their work. Sometimes only as accessories, sometimes for full pieces, or sometimes for full shows. The designers that do this uh, include, but are not limited to, Mugler, Victor and Loff, Lanvin, Christopher Kane, Maison Margiela, uh, <laughs> Mark Jacobs, so many. And let's uh, take a peek at some of those, shall we? Now, we've talked about Mugler before. Here, Primary example, you have that just juxtaposition of odd objects, you know, a uh, bike woman taking the woman, making her a machine. You have that little erotic metaphor of, hey, want to go for a ride? Um, that sort of thing. Um, you have very much that taking that thing, that one thing, and making it into something else. Case in point, right here on the thigh, that cup holder, it's now a thigh garter. Um, shape repetition was also very prominent in surrealist work, and you have that here with the ram's head being mimicked by the mirrors here, and then again on the smaller chest piece accessory here. So you can see there that, ra yes, motorcycle dress. It is taking a motorcycle and making it into a dress. It is 
uh, playing with erotic metaphor, uh, Mugler enjoyed one, exaggerating the silhouette and turning his models into otherworldly beings themselves. Again, something we saw earlier in the surrealist paintings. And then again, Mugler, androgyny, and blending the gender binary. Again, very surrealist, taking uh, male presenting or androgen people, feminizing them or masculinizing them, depending on which direction um, they were going in. And then, of course, exaggerating the silhouette. Very surrealist, taking away the face, bringing the neckline all the way up and almost over the head, which plays into those themes very, 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 very well. So, let's move on to our next designer. Victor and Rolf. This one, I really like this one a lot, and um, I'll tell you why. So, everybody remembers the great economic oh no of 2008. <laughs> Um, and if you don't remember it, uh, I'm sure some of your older friends do. Um, so the brothers are literally quoted as, we had to cut back, so we did it literally in our dresses. They demonstrated cutting back in the gowns by creating these gravity-defying, illusion-creating dresses that, visual that are quite visually confusing because they almost don't look real, but they are structurally sound. They can walk the runway, they can be worn. So let's take a closer look at these. So here you have a whole hole, an entire hole, just in the middle of the dress, you have the cut tool. These are tool ball gowns. So there's a tunnel that's been made through this, hacked off here and hacked off here to create gorgeous asymmetry. You have layers created in this tool ball gown, almost like it's being peeled. Very reminiscent of an onion as well. And then we have cutting off at the past, like cutting off at the middle here. Like that can be very much, that's very, that's a very, it's a very literal metaphor, um, especially at the time, you know, you have to cut off the excess. <laughs> um, and then of course, uh, the, uh, really just absolutely wild sort of I, I i honestly don't even know how to accurately describe this just the way it sort of seems like it's hanging off the body um or it's glitched in some way uh mark jacobs this one too i'm actually a really big fan of so this is more so surrealism through accessorizing um the repetition of the bag in a bag uh, so it brings in those absurd elements of, well, you put a bag in my bag or attached a bag to another bag, and now it, it it's difficult to use, if we can even use it at all. And then, of course, you have the backward shoe, the illusion that we're, you know, going when we're coming or coming when we're going. Yeah, a bag bag. <laughs> a bag in a bag, if you will. So here we see uh, the shoe here, and then... We also have another shoe here in a separate color. It's so interesting how they were able to fit kind of the heel of the shoe here into the lower arch of the foot. I need to know what it's like to walk on these because it looks absolutely insane. And then, of course, you have, you know, disjointed faces. That's another surrealist element. The bags in bags or bags attached to bags. Now, see, on the, as a concept, this looks really interesting because it's like, oh, I have my my bag and then my bag on outside of my bag. But if you were to try to open this purse here, this outer purse, it would be very, very cumbersome. You can see here that it's like on the outside. It is a bag attached to a bag. <laughs> um, let's see here. And then you have this one, of course, in another color. In theory, it makes sense, but only in theory. Only in the mind would something like this make sense. This is something you would see in your in a dream, in in a in a in a weird trance-like state. If you just let your mind wander, these are the sorts of things your brain would come up with, and that is the point of surrealism. That's that's exactly you're getting it. Very good, very good. And then of course Christopher Kane. Now surrealism deals with a lot of sex, sexuality, eroticism. And these garments, the entire show had this underlying theme of desire, of sexuality, and surrealism deals with underlying desires. It deals with those thoughts. It deals with those feelings. And so 
what Christopher Kane's house did, played with bright color and jagged lines to represent that sort of spark of electricity, that spark of sensuality. Um, the figures on the gowns actually came from sketches that Kane and his team had made during their life drawing classes. Um, and they recreated them in a lace material to sort of further emphasize that delicate, that very sensual nature of the garment. So you can see that lace here, the way it lays across the figure, the very delicate outlining of the arms of the hands, um, the sort of asymmetrical lining so that it looks like they're lying in bed sheets. You're wearing uh, essentially an erotic scene on your body. Yes. And then, of course, we have uh, Maison Margiela. Now, we've discussed Maison Margiela before. Maison Margiela kind of covers a wide breadth of different styles. A three-person dress. Yes, there you go. You can wear your own three-way. Imagine that. <laughs> um, now, specifically, this is specifically Maison Margiela's 20th anniversary collection. Um, there were actually concerns that the director was going to retire. However, what the director presented instead was a compilation of 20 years of Maison Margiela's work um, that included faceless models, backwards hairstyles, all sorts of ridiculous silhouettes. Um, and this little gimmick here, where they used a spotlight and a projector to project or emphasize one part or another of the given model. So let's take a look at that as well. Backwards. They're backwards. I want you to like look at this for a second. Especially the use of doubles. Again, image repetition, something heavily used in surrealist work. But you have the, the doubles, the pairs, walking towards you, but they're walking away. But really, what are they doing in this sort of... This here, this here too, the sort of half suit kind of glitching on and, and off the body in a sort of way. When you dream of people, how often do you see their faces clearly? You really can't unless it's somebody you've seen before. And so I feel like this particular collection really captures that, um, that particular notion, that, that play with dreams um, and the unconscious mind. And then last but certainly not least, Levin. Um, these are references, actually, to Scaparelli's work. It creates an illusion, again, illusion, of a face. And I um, would also like chat to note how the material of this blouse looks like paper. It almost looks like wrapping that the jewelry is resting inside of, which I think is absolutely fantastic. It's very subtle. It's much more subtle. Um, and I added all of these in here to show like a wide range of what surrealist work, especially in the fashion realm, could look like. And I really love that it looks like she's wearing her jewelry packaging on her body. And this looks like it could be a direct reference to another Scaparelli Dali collab, which is these pieces here. This is called The Eye of Time. It was made in 1959. Um, and you can sort of see the similarities here, especially in the shape of these two eye pins. And so this could be a reference directly or otherwise, or perhaps just an allusion to this particular piece. And you can see the similarities in the construction um, of the eyes specifically. And I just found that to be very, very neat. So, conclusion! <laughs> It's not a one-to-one -one translation. I feel like it would be uh, incredibly difficult to do. Not impossible. Um, there are certain paintings of Dali's where he's incorporated um, works of Scaparelli into uh, his piece. So it's not impossible, but it depends on what direction you're going. So what, what was the point of all this? Uh, the absurd, the weird, the erotic, they're all present. And the point of this is to be able to express yourself in as many ways as possible, much like our previous lecture um, where we were exploring alternative means for alternative clothing with horror and fashion, surrealism and fashion really lets you put parts of yourself out there in like it's so easy. It's it makes it really good when you play with surrealist elements, you can really get into expressing yourself in ways that it's like a secret for you. But other people may not know like to someone that might just be a lobster on a dress but for you it could represent your fear of sea arachnids who knows you know like that's that's the important thing 
it gives you an outlet for playing with concepts, which I do hope that you feel inspired to explore after this lecture. Do we have any questions before we conclude for the day? I really appreciate so many of you turning out. Um, there's my thank you slide. <laughs> Yes, Giger would fit in with the erotic. He would fit in with the... Well, H.R. Geiger is really interesting because H.R. Geiger is specifically sci-fi, and we are going to be doing a sci-fi in fashion lecture for April. So I hope you guys are excited about that. But he could fit here if you really wanted to. But the point of the matter is, is that surrealism in clothing, much like surrealism in art, it boils down quite literally, if we're going to knock it to brass tacks, to self-expression about expressing your inner world and you can do that in a variety of ways it doesn't necessarily have to be with body parts or anything like that you can you can use wildlife or illusions or anything in any which way you want to and that's what i think is so beautiful about it thank you all for joining me for my second ever lecture i hope you found it informative i hope you found it uh entertaining i know i did